Io passo senz'altro la parola al professor Patrick Gheary dell'Università di Princeton che parlerà sul tema The Use of Ancient DNA to Analyze Population Movements Between Pannonia and Italy in the 6th century. Prego, professor. Uh, uh, è già là. Thank you. I would like to reclaim my 10 minutes that were stolen previously. Uh, Professor Piazza has shown how modern DNA can be used to explore population movements in the historical past. In his recent paper in the uh, Journal of European History, uh, he and his colleagues were able to find evidence of the presence of a mix of central northern European genomes in northern Italy that they could hypothetically date to the range between the first century before the Common Era and the early 8th century. They estimated this to have been the result of the so-called migration period, the topic of this conference, and find it consistent with Y-chromosomal markers in the populations of the village of Participanza in San Giovanni in Perischetto, dated to sometime in the 8th to the 15th centuries. Alessandro Boattini and his colleagues wish to explain the genetic structure found in this village of Participanza with the arrival of Lombards in northern Italy. This approach is similar to that used by the team under the direction of Sir Walter Bodmer in the peopling of the British Isles and the extremely suggestive study of Ralph and Coop on geography of recent genetic ancestry across Europe. Such analysis is certainly suggestive particularly when used for very broad time spans. In Bodmer's study uh, uh, of the population of Great Britain, for example, the team uh, recruited individuals across Britain whose four grandparents were all born within 50 miles of each other. Using a method for detecting fine-scale population structures, they identified clusters organized hierarchically such that they could create a tree showing the relation among 17 clusters. Their analysis of the DNA showed that these clusters, although based exclusively on genetic proximity and not geography, showed geographically distinct clusterings, clusters that they correlate with different waves of migration. By comparing these clusters with genetic data from the continent, they were further able to correlate relationships between continental and British populations. They explain a large cluster that covers much of eastern Great Britain as evidence of Saxon invasions. They attributed other finer scale clusters to even earlier tribal and kingdom boundaries prior to Saxon invasions. No such detailed study has ever been attempted for continental Europe. Indeed, given the greater complexity of the continent, the likelihood of greater population movement and change such an approach might not be possible, except in some unusual cases, such as an Italian village, such as Participanza. The most promising attempt at continental-wide analysis was that of Ralph and Coop, who, using the Popra's database of modern European genomes collected from volunteers in Lausanne and London, they examined specific chromosomal regions shared between pairs of individuals from the same ancestor in the past, known as tracts of identity by descent, or IDB. They found that almost all European individuals shared hundreds of ancestors within the last 3,000 years, although in general, pairs of individuals from the same location shared larger IBD tracts. By examining the number and size of IBD tracts, they also attempt to calculate the approximate date of differentiation, providing a rough time scale for genetic differences within populations. Thus, for example, Eastern Europeans share a significant number of IBD segments, which they date to 1,000 to 2,000 years ago, and speculate that this may be evidence of the Slavic expansion as well as Hunnic invasions into regions such as Hungary and Romania. These and other attempts to understand European migration through modern DNA analysis are significant, but in terms of historical analysis, they are somewhat problematic. First, they assume population stability, 
that if one's grandparents lived in a specific area, these same families have been in place for a millennium or more. This may be the case in some isolated communities, but in much of Europe, war, plague, economic change, modernization, and other historical phenomena have presumably had major impacts on population across the centuries. To assume differently is to deny the reality of history, making the past but a single moment in time, the moment of migration, and negating all that came before or after. While unique villages certainly exist, their existence tells us little about the extent of migrations in the past. This observation raises a second, and from the historical perspective, a more serious problem with relying on modern DNA for historical analysis. By studying modern DNA, we can learn a great deal about the present and its relationship to the past. But it does not tell us about the alterity of the past. In essence, studying modern DNA is studying the winners. It does not allow us to see the diversity that might have existed in the past and might have been extremely significant, but that was lost in the course of time. Finally, as we can see from these examples, using modern DNA does not provide a careful, chronologically precise image of population movements and change in the past. At best, one observes patterns that could have a time range of hundreds, if not thousands of years. And then one attempts to correlate these patterns to known migrations or invasions. This must remain highly speculative. And for the historian who seeks to understand the dynamics of specific population changes in the last 2,000 years, inadequate. For all of these reasons, the team that I have organized has, been, has determined to study not modern DNA and then extrapolate back in time to some assumed population, but to analyze ancient DNA taken from specific datable cemeteries from the period and the region that we are researching. In spite of the many difficulties in studying ancient DNA, which I will not go into today, its primary advantage is that by analyzing DNA from archaeological sites, one is working directly with the population that one wishes to study, rather than assuming that a modern population can serve as a proxy for an historical population. The second and related advantage is that by focusing on ancient DNA, one can assess the entire spectrum of genomic data from a past population, not only that which has managed to survive into the present. Given the difficulties of capturing and sequencing ancient DNA, many studies have concentrated on mitochondrial DNA, that portion of the genome inherited exclusively in the female line. Because mitochondria DNA exists in hundreds of copies within each cell, while nuclear DNA is present in only one copy in each cell, one can hope to obtain mitochondrial DNA even from badly degraded specimens. However, mitochondria DNA presents only a very small portion of an individual's ancestry. Moreover, since mitochondrial DNA provides information only about maternal ancestry, it's not very informative about societies that cohere around male lineages and draw women in from other populations. For these reasons, our team determined to focus on the much richer but more challenging nuclear DNA that contains the entire ancestry of an individual. Fortunately, recent advantages in genomic advances in genomic science in the past five years have made this possible. Our interest was to develop a method for exploring the structure of early medieval communities and for estimating migrations between regions of Europe. To this end, we chose to focus on the populations of Pannonia and Northern Italy in the sixth century. Our reason was simple. 
First, we have both relatively detailed written sources concerning these two areas in the period of the Longobard migrations, uh, including accounts of Longobard invasion and conquest of Italy in the 560s and 70s. Similarly, generations of archaeologists have identified what they assert are Longobard cemeteries in Pannonia and Italy that show cultural continuities that they argue are evidence of significant migration. Regardless of the accuracy of written sources or the correctness of labeling cemeteries as Longobard, both provide models against which to test genomic evidence. We made one further determination at the outset of our study. That is to focus intensively rather than extensively in collecting our samples. Most ancient DNA studies, for reasons of cost, availability of samples, and desire to draw broad conclusions, tend to sample only a few grades from a spectrum of sites. For example, a very fine study by Stefan she uh, Stephen Scheffels of Anglo-Saxon uh, genomes analyzed 10 whole genomes from three sites in East England that range chronologically from the late Iron Age to the middle of the Anglo-Saxon period. Similarly, a study of southeastern Europe by David Reich analyzed the genome-wide ancient DNA from 225 individuals, but they lived in, a re in the region over a period of 11,500 years. Such studies can produce important evidence, but by sampling a few individuals from widely different sites, they do not permit one to study the genetic diversity or biological kinship organizations of individual communities. By taking one or two graves as proxies for an entire community, they run the risk of homogenizing what may have been actually a quite diverse community. Thus, we decided in a first attempt to sequence nuclear ancient DNA from every individual buried in two 6th century cemeteries. I must say, of course, that two cemeteries is proof of nothing. We need hundreds of cemeteries, but this is the first time anyone has ever tried to do this, so give us credit for that. With the advice of archaeologists in Italy and Hungary, we selected two sites, Solad in modern Hungary, and Colegno near Turino in Italy. While entirely avoiding the question of whether or not our populations were in some sense Longobard, we developed a series of specific historical questions. First, we wanted to examine whether it was possible to identify groups of different genetic origins in these cemeteries, and if so, to determine whether these different heritage corresponded to different cultural patterns. Second, we wanted to understand the organizing principles of these cemeteries. To what extent do biologically related kin groups determine the organization of burials rather than gender, status, age, or other criteria? And then third, we wanted to determine whether there were close genetic relationships between the populations we identified in Pannonia and those in Italy that practiced similar burial customs. We were able to generate paleogenetic data for 63 individuals from our two cemeteries. At Solad, there are 45 graves uh, excavated by Tiva Davida, who will be speaking uh, uh, after me all of which are dated to the middle of the third of the sixth century based on a combination of stylistic elements, grave goods, radiocarbon analysis, archeological and stable isotope, uh, and modern uh, the mitochondria analysis. This suggests that Solad was occupied for only about 20 to 30 years by a mobile group of settlers. Graves in the cemetery are organized such that there is a core group of 18 mostly male individuals, surrounded by a half ring of 11 uh, females. So the, the core group, a uh, group, uh, ring of uh, females, uh, 
Most of these individuals are in elaborate graves with ledge walls, wooden chambers, furnished with numerous artifacts. The remaining 16 uh, contemporary graves are more diverse in relationship to the sex of the individuals as well as the quality of grave constructed and richness of artifacts, those outside of the core. The cemetery at Colegno was in use from the late 6th through the early 8th century, the earliest period of the Longobard Kingdom in Italy. We studied the 57 graves that date between archaeologically between 580 and 630 and represent the first of three major periods of occupation. The cemetery developed from the center outwards to the east and west, and the types and range of grave goods in these interments are comparable to those recovered at Solad. But there's also evidence for gradual cultural and religious evolution with some rituals disappearing in later decades. There are no ledge graves, some are constructed, however, via a wooden chamber structure, and there is a skeleton of a horse lacking its head in both cemeteries. Using Illumina sequencing of DNA extracts from the petrous bone, that is this very dense inner ear bone, uh, we identified 38 and 21 samples from Solat and Kalenia, respectively, which appeared promising for genomic analysis. Genomic libraries for the majority of the samples uh, underwent partial UDG treatment. A unique endogenous DNA content was sufficient for 10 male samples from Solad, uh, also from Petrus bones, to undergo whole genome sequencing uh, with a mean, for those of you who are interested, a mean genome-wide coverage across samples of 11.3 uh, the remaining 53 samples underwent uh, a protocol that targeted a set of previously described 1.2 million single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. The average cover for these, if you're interested, excluding the whole genomes, was about 1.5. Uh, in addition, we assemble comparative data from uh, SNPs for different uh, various other modern reference European samples, as well as 211 ancient West Eurasians from around 6,000 to 300 before the Common Era. And we included comparative genomic data from seven genomes from the UK associated with the Anglo-Saxons, those that I mentioned before that Scheffels had studied, as well as two from Bavaria. So briefly, let me tell you what we have found. First, we investigate whether our two cemeteries contain burials of individuals sharing common genetic ancestry. To do this, we compared our ancient samples against modern reference sets and determined that indeed our samples possess genetic ancestry that overlaps overwhelmingly with modern Europeans. However, rather than being clustered close to their respective modern countries, Samples from Solat and Colegno can be placed alongside major northern and southern axis of modern European genetic variation. Uh, this north-south axis of genetic variation is also observed when examining only our ancient samples. Let's see. Uh, well, uh, I was hoping. <laughs> sorry. But we the. The northern, in Solad, you see here uh, northern population in blue, southern population uh, in, uh, in red. We analyzed our ancient samples using supervised model-based clustering to look at evidence of admixture and compared eight other European and non-European populations as parental populations. We found that Central European, largely Northern Central European, is a major genetic component in Solod, with it being the major type in 25 of the 33 individuals. The second most prominent ancestry is TSI, or Italian, essentially Tuscan, and is the major component in the remaining nine individuals. But interesting, in spite of being located in northern Italy, the northern-southern ancestry is also prominent in Colegno, as, uh, as you can see. This is uh, the, the two 
uh, populations, uh, Colenio and Zolad, and we find this northern population there. In both cemeteries, individuals with predominantly central northern and southern European ancestry possess very distinct grave furnishings. In order to quantify this relationship, we classified individuals into either northern or southern groups based on their proportion of north central uh, or southern European ancestry. And we used these to do a series of uh, Fisher exact tests to associate statistically the association of material culture and ancestry. Uh, we found that in both Solat and Colenio, individuals with northern ancestry are significantly more often buried with grave goods. In contrast, no southern individual is buried with such artifacts, with only two exceptions, two women. We note that one of these is stylistically distinct, possibly Roman, from the artifacts found in other graves in the same cemetery. Uh, the grave type also significantly differs in both cemeteries, with northern individuals presenting more elaborate graves, often with ledge walls or in, uh, wooden elements. In order to answer our second question concerning relationship between biological kinship and organization of the cemeteries, we took advantage of genome-wide SNP information to infer pairwise biological relatedness within ancient cemeteries at an unprecedented level compared to previous studies. We term these groups of biologically related individuals kindreds, although of course we know that kindred can uh, in, uh, in other contexts mean other relationships and purely biological. And we used a new method that evaluates genotype likelihoods to model identity by descent and specifically designed to account for low coverage data such as we have. Within Solod, we identified four kindreds among the Longobard area burials, with one particularly large spanning three generations and consisting of 10 individuals. This is this one here. And they are buried in close spatial proximity. In this kindred, they're buried with rich diversity of grave goods, all but one lay in elaborate wedged, ledged graves. Only two members are female and are estimated to be between three and five and 17 to 25 years old, respectively, at death. The rest are males aged from very young to around 65. These graves occupy a prominent position in the northwest of the cemetery, with all but one found among the core group. Uh, this one is in the externalized uh, uh, ring of, of women outs outside of this, up here. Six male individuals in this kindred were buried with weapons and shields, despite three being teenagers at the time of death. The adult males in the kindred appear to have had access to a particularly high quality diet, as inferred from nitrogen and isotopic analysis. And the individual in uh, number 13 has the deepest grave and is probably the only individual in the whole cemetery whose burial includes a scale and a horse, which may be indication of his differentiated status in the society. While individuals in this kindred are predominantly of a central northern European genetic ancestry, they are not genetically homogeneous. Three contain noticeable southern ancestry, and, seem, and two seem to have had an ancestry closer to modern French populations. In Colenio, we identified three kindreds, one with partic one extent, particularly extensive. Nine of the ten individuals from the largest kindred were buried in elaborate graves and with, uh, and with artifacts. In contrast to Solad, Individuals with close biological relationships can occupy spatially distant graves, as you can see in, uh, in the case of this group, which is connected, but they are not geographically proximate. Interesting, the spatial cluster with six individuals is chronologically older than the more westernly trio. Two of these kindreds are predominantly of central northern European ancestry. And members of these two large kindred groups also appear to have generally consumed more animal protein than the other individuals in the cemetery, as suggested by nitrogen isotopic analysis. An earlier study of strontium from Solod had indicated that the adult population was non-local, 
but had migrated into the area. We generated new stable strontium isotopic data for Colenio to complement the existing data from Zolad and analyze them within the context of our genomic data in order to better understand patterns of immigration at the two sites. Within Zolad, we find that adult individuals with both predominantly northern central and southern genomic ancestry profess possess rather similar non-local signatures. In other words, the southern group are not indigenous and the northern group immigrants. They're all new arrivals at the site. This might suggest that individuals from both ancestry groups immigrated into Zolad together, despite the differences in material culture. However, we also know generally a very diverse non-local range among adults with central northern ancestry pointing to not all the individuals having origins from the same location prior to settling in Solod. In contrast, in Colenio, all five individuals with major southern ancestry exhibit local strontium signatures. However, when examining the two major families, we observe the striking general pattern that the older the generation, the more diverged their strontium isotope signature is from the local range. This appears to fit a model of individuals of central northern European ancestry migrating and settling in Colenio amongst a set of local individuals of primarily Italian origin. What can we conclude from this? Obviously nothing. It's just two cemeteries in all of Pannonia and Italy. It's the best cemeteries excavated in both regions, but it's only a start. What we do see most striking is the discovery of two main clusters of genetic ancestry shared among our two 6th to 7th century cemeteries separated by over 1,000 kilometers. If we orient this ancestry using modern populations, they correspond to an axis of central northern European ancestry versus southern European ancestry. And particularly significant is the fact that in both Zolot and Colenio, this genetic variation mirrors the variation that emerges from their material culture. This perhaps suggests that the concept of long-term shared common descent in shaping social identity reflected in objects in the graves may have had an actual biological basis in these two cemeteries. But we must be cautious in including that this association between genetic ancestry and material culture reflects peoples mentioned in historical text, that is, Langobards. We do not yet know whether this, general, this genetic ancestry reflects recent population changes in the two regions, or rather long-term populations. Only future analyses that we are conducting now of fifth century cemeteries will make it possible to determine whether these patterns are novel or centuries old. Our research also provides novel insight into structures and hierarchies of societies from the migration period in two very different contexts. We're able to show that the burials at Zolot are organized predominantly around a large 10-member, three-generation kindred all but one of whom are predominantly north-central ancestry. Members here stand out in relationship to the other in terms of diet, position of their graves, presence of the oldest individual in the cemetery, deepest and most uh, elaborate graves. Then surrounding this is this half ring of women with 10 additional male graves, also of north-central genetic ancestry, but showing more diversity. All adults and teenagers have weapons. Three out of four adults share the same non-local strontium signature as adults in primary kindred. The half ring of women itself has a mixture of individuals who are both majority central northern European ancestry and have diverse strontium isotope signatures. Since the adults are all non-local, it's tempting to suggest that we may be observing the historically described fara during migration. Now, Farah is, of course, the term appearing in contemporary account of the Longobard invasion by Marius of Avanche, later in Lombard law, in Paulus Diaconus. But scholars have differed on whether the term designated a mobile military unit or a kinship unit. 
as the late 8th century Paul Diocon, uh, Paulus Diaconus defined it. Given that the militarized position of the population in both cemeteries seems to have been organized largely by kinship, one might speculate that in these cases we see a military unit organized around one high-status, kin-based group of predominant males, but also incorporating other males that may have some common Central Northern European descent. The relative lack of adult female representatives in the major kindred, the diverse genetic and isotopic signatures of the sampled women around the males, and their rich grave goods suggest that women may have been acquired and incorporated into the unit during the process of migration. The remaining seven members of the community for which we have genomic data are individuals mainly Southern European genetic ancestry, conspicuously lacking grave goods and occupying the marginal part of the cemetery with random orientation. While the lack of grave goods does not necessarily imply that these individuals were of lower status, it does point to them belonging to a different social group. And interestingly, based on stable estrontium analysis, it's appeared that they migrated together with the warrior group from outside of Solat. A colenio, colenio likely represents a community that eventually settled over multiple generations. Again, however, it appears to have been organized around at least one large extended immigrant kindred. However, there is more spatial variation, with kindred spreading outwards from the center of the cemetery. There's also one other significant but smaller immigrant kindred of a different genetic origin and material culture that also holds a central position in the cemetery. And for this first period of occupation, at least, these two groups appear to have remained genetically distinct despite living in the same location. Also in Colenio, the individual of southern ancestry appear to be local. Uh, they show more scattered burials and are poorer in terms of grave goods and in animal protein consumption. As such, it's tempting to infer a scenario of these large immigrant barbarian families settling, uh, exerting a dominating influence in the community. And then finally, our data, while not proving, certainly do not contradict the image of the historically documented migration of Longobards from Pannonia to Italy at the end of the 6th century. We see this central northern ancestry dominant not only in Zolad, but also in Calenia. And based on modern genetic data, we would not expect to see such a preponderance of this ancestry in either Hungary or especially in northern Italy. However, we must be careful not to jump to the conclusion that our central northern population is some unitary Longobard population that began a migratory process in northern Europe and arrived first in Pannonia and then subsequently in Italy. We do not yet know the general genomic background of these geographic regions. It is impossible to know the genomic background in northern Europe because of the practice of cremation. And uh, until we further study fifth century graves in Pannonia, we simply cannot answer that. Written evidence suggests various barbarian populations had been infiltrating the Danubian limes, as well as settling as military units in northern Italy for well over a century. Thus, while it's likely that the warrior population in both sites was in some way part of the Longobard army, and thus functionally might be termed Longobards, it's also possible that their biological ancestors had been in both regions long before the expansion of the Longobard rule in Pannonia and then in Italy. Thus, it is essential that this project and many others like it, perhaps followed by people in this room, would continue with particular focus on cemeteries representing the population in both regions prior to the sixth century. Likewise, while our evidence which corresponds at most to three generations, indicates relatively little intermarriage taking place uh, in the sixth and early seventh centuries. Uh, we need uh, to expand our analysis, particularly Colenio, into the later parts of the seventh century in order to see uh, when, if at all, these two biologically distinct populations begin to merge into a new society. In other words, we have only made a very tentative first start. Much remains to be done. And I would like to mention the very large and important team that has made this preliminary study 
uh, possible. As you see, some of the people who are here today uh, from Hungary, from Italy, from Austria, from Germany, from North America, from Britain. And I am very grateful to all of them. Thank you. Thank you.